Hello, everybody. Uh, welcome to this uh, session, virtual session called Going Hybrid, Lessons from Quebec and Ontario Immigrant Serving Agencies During the Pandemic. Uh, we're virtual in various locations, and I would like to uh, acknowledge that we are on the unceded territories of various um, uh, Indigenous peoples and nations. So we have three presenters and a discussant. We will have Valerie Preston, John Shields, Jill Hanley, and then Stefan Reichhold as a discuss as a discussant. Valerie. Hello. Um, today I want to present a case study of immigrant serving agencies during the pandemic to understand how they use technology to transform service delivery. And I particularly want to talk about some of the impacts of this transition on workers and clients. But before I do that, I need to acknowledge my co-authors who are listed here on the screen in front of you, as well as Manoli Ekra, who was formerly at Ocasi and instrumental in putting together this project. Uh, our partners, Ocasi and TCRV, without whom the research wouldn't have happened. We had a small working group at the BMRC IRMU partnership. And I also want to thank all the participants in the survey, as well as SHIRT for funding the research. In this paper, what I'm going to do is ask what happened to immigrant serving agencies when the world locked down. Mainly accustomed to in-person service delivery, the agencies underwent a rapid, disruptive, and ultimately quite successful technological transformation. But in order to answer the question of how they did it and what the implications were, I'm going to report the findings from some survey data regarding three questions. How did these agencies use technology to deliver services? How did the technology affect the workforce of those immigrant serving agencies? And how did the technology affect their clients? We have information from two points in time so that the surveys allow us to move beyond just whether or not agencies succeeded in going online, but to examine some of the impacts. Before I do that, let me remind you about immigrant serving agencies in Ontario. They are mainly funded by the federal government with some provincial funding to provide integration and settlement services, including employment services, orientation services, as well as language training. They have historically offered services in person, except when they've gone into the community offering services in libraries and through the settlement workers in schools programs in some of the public schools. They have been funded on either a per service basis or a per client basis or some combination. And in Ontario, the immigrant serving agencies entered the pandemic with four key characteristics. A few had experience with pre-arrival services provided online. And this was key because it meant that they had some idea of how to provide services online, even in a limited way. And they had the technological support in-house. The second thing is the immigrant serving agencies operate with project funding. And that project funding is fairly restricted. They are not able to easily move funds from one budget line to another to pay for technology, pay for the people to maintain that technology. And it tends to leave the immigrant serving agencies in, without a financial cushion. They are paid for projects, not for the overall operations of the agency. And the last important characteristic is that in Ontario, at least, the immigrant serving agencies hire many immigrant workers. For immigrant workers, these are key jobs that give them some Canadian experience that offer them uh, familiarity with the Canadian workplace that pay not very high wages. Uh, jobs that are sometimes insecure. Many people, because of project funding, are hired on a contract basis. Let me remind you about the pandemic in Ontario. March 17th, the government declared a state of emergency and we entered wave one of the pandemic. And that 
meant that schools closed, only essential workers were allowed to go to work, employers were required to permit uh, remote work, and the outcome was that many people became unemployed uh, as specific sectors of the economy completely shut down, about a third of it. Food and accommodations was a good example. Uh, about a third of workers were deemed essential, and about a third of workers were working from home. The closure of the schools presented serious problems to workers at home because they had to both work, do their jobs, and care for their children. Starting in September of 2020, the schools reopened briefly uh, on a very restricted schedule. And starting in October, we began to enter new waves of the pandemic. Waves two, three, and four went on for a year from September 2020 to 21. And we had a series of closure in the reinstitution of restrictions. And I want to point out the restrictions were not as serious as in Quebec, where in Quebec there were, at least in the Montreal area, curfews. Uh, we did not have any curfews. So we were interested in how did the immigrant serving agency adapt to the pandemic. We did two surveys. One was completed by OPASI between March and September 2020, looking at what was the initial impact uh, that crisis period uh, in the pandemic. And then we did a second survey starting after September 2021, asking uh, workers and managers to reflect on their experiences during the second, third, and fourth waves of the pandemic. And the manager survey, which was sent to the executive directors of all OCASI member agencies, approximately 240 of them, uh, asked that one person in the agency complete it, took about 20 minutes, asked a long series of questions about demographics, the impacts of the pandemic and their concerns for the future. 56 agencies responded to survey one, 54 agencies to survey two. The worker survey was shorter, asked similar questions, but related to workers' experiences and their views about the return to the office. 198 workers responded to the survey about the first six months of the pandemic. 185 workers responded to the survey about the subsequent 12 months. And I want to point out that we think this response rate is just miraculous. Since we were told no one would respond, they were too tired. Uh, the other thing I want to point out is it's a large enough number that we can use it to illustrate what's happening, but we cannot claim it's representative. This is a web-based survey, so we have no idea, um, no way of guaranteeing who responded to it. Um, we know the overall number of agencies, we know the overall, we have an estimate of the overall workforce, uh, but, it's a web-based survey. We work free to respond or not respond. The other thing I need to point out is these are two separate surveys. We cannot link the responses to survey one to the responses in survey two. So we can simply compare the responses. We can't say that anyone changed their behavior or any agency changed. We also did a few focus groups with executive directors at the immigrant serving agencies as well as the leads at the local immigration partnership, mainly to check on our interpretation of the survey information. Um, just to give you some sense of the overall message, these were tumultuous times. When we asked executive directors or, or the designated manager at each agency, how much change did you see in your services between September 2020 and 21? Approximately three quarters experienced substantial or moderate change. This was similar across the province, and it followed six months of a crisis response. So the change is a process. 
the pandemic did not just cause an immediate change and then agency was brought back to work as normal. They were in a continuous state of change during both of these periods. And a lot of that change had to do with the use of technology. Um, this graph shows a response to questions about changes in service delivery between surveys one and two. Uh, survey one is blue, survey two is orange. And I want you to notice in the first six months, all of the agencies went online, 100%. But between September 2020 and 21, about 90%, 89% of agencies continued to move services online. So that transition to digital technology continued throughout the 18 month period. The second thing I'd like to point out is we've seen a hybrid service model emerge. In the first six months of the pandemic, less than 20% of agencies had remained open for any services. That percentage almost doubled by September, 2021. And we know from the focus groups that what happened was two things. Agencies reopened to serve their most vulnerable clients, many of whom were refugees, but they were certainly the people who had limited digital literacy, who were having real trouble getting online. Uh, these are sometimes people who are not literate in any language, uh, and sometimes they're just people like me who can't remember to share their screen because they're getting old and gray uh, in many cases. Uh, so what we see during the second period, that September 2020 to 21 period, is the emergence of a hybrid model. And that hybrid model increased staff work hours. This did the original move to online delivery of services, but the increase continued between September 2020 and 21. Those changes in technology restored service volumes. In March, when the agencies had to shut down, all services ended. But by September 2021, about 60% of workers say that their agencies have achieved pre-level pre-COVID levels of service. Another 30% said their agencies was close to pre-COVID levels of service. This means there were only 10% of agencies by September, 2021, who were still having a gap in services. And managers confirmed this. They confirmed that during waves two, three, and four, they actually increased the volume of services, at least 60% of them now. So the shift online and then the subsequent shift to hybrid allowed agencies to restore the volume of services. There were still some problems. Agencies had tremendous difficulties reaching out to immigrants and promoting their services. 39% of workers said that community outreach and promotion continued to be difficult during waves two, three, and four from September 2020 to September 2021. Even though a third of agencies were using virtual technology, 21% or so had actually developed webinars, virtual learning opportunities. They had really worked hard. Um, there were still a lot of problems uh, reaching out. And managers expressed similar concerns. And in particular, managers were concerned about the loss of volunteers. During the first six months of the pandemic, 41% of agencies recorded such substantial loss of volunteers. That loss continued between September 2020 and 21, with a third of agencies reporting they had lost volunteers during that period. Volunteers are really important to immigrant serving agencies. They augment the workforce. They act as interpreters. 
and they are key for community outreach and promotion. They are the people who go into the community and tell their friends, neighbors, uh, as well as other family members about the availability of these services. And we know from other research that that is how most immigrants find out about these services. So technology succeeded in getting the volume of services back. What did it do to the workers? Well, Valerie, would you be able to wrap up in two minutes? Uh, the important thing about the workers was that just as the process of going online continued for the 18 months, the problems with online technology became more obvious during the 18 months. In particular, workers became more and more concerned about social isolation, mental health and stress issues, and they continued to be unable to maintain life work balance. Uh, large proportions of them, 40%. The agencies responded fairly effectively to those concerns. 85% of managers emphasized the importance of providing support for online work. They had tried to increase that support. And I just want to show you quickly this graph. I want you to look at the left-hand side. Supporting online work was the priority that almost 80% of managers had undertaken during that September 2020 to 21 period. So it's not surprising then that workers felt that productivity had been maintained. Almost 50% felt an increase, 34% felt it had stayed the same. What is more remarkable is the satisfaction. Managers felt more than 90% of them that staff management relations had either stayed the same or improved, and about 80% of workers agree with them that the organization has taken appropriate actions. In terms of clients, workers initially expressed real concern about clients getting online, and it was during the waves two, three, and four that will, they identified three actions that agencies have taken to support their clients. And this is more than half of the workers. The hybrid model was key, these new virtual platforms and the guidelines and webinars. And as a result, they felt that almost two thirds of clients were as pleased or more pleased as pre-pandemic levels. And only about 4% were distinctly disconnected. So this is a story of tremendous success. And what I want to point out is that that success raises questions about funding and funding. How are the agencies going to continue to fund their technology takes money for the hardware and the software and the maintenance. And how are they going to address the staffing question? Workers may feel they're productive, but I didn't have a chance to point it out. Staff turnover is a growing concern of managers. So let me finish right there. And if you have any questions, I'll be glad to answer them. Thank you very much. Valerie. Um, we have uh, 55 participants uh, online at the moment. Please feel free to write your questions in the Q&A section and we'll we'll deal with them when everybody's presented and Stefan has made some discussant comments. So our next presenter will be John Shields. Okay, uh, thank you. Um, so uh, this presentation uh, comes out of the uh, collaborative work of the BMRC uh, project. Uh, led by uh, Valerie Preston. And the uh, focus here is on the place of collaboration and advocacy in its various dimensions and how this connects to resilience in the future of immigrant settlement and integration. The overall point to be made is about the central importance of enhanced collaboration and advocacy for the settlement sector. If we are to build back better, and of course that was the promise of the post-pandemic period, then collaborative 
uh, collaboration and advocacy roles of the settlement se sector organizations need to continue to be active and in fact enhanced and needs actually to be reflected in the funding uh, model uh, for these uh, organizations. Uh, during the pandemic, there was an emphasis on, the, on meeting the crisis through collaboration and partnerships uh, in and between sectors. Uh, collaboration and partnerships were greatly expanded during this time. Uh, and outside of Quebec, uh, the LIPS, uh, Local Immigrant Partnerships, played an especially important coordinating uh, role. Uh, immigrant uh, settlement agencies, ISAs, developed enhanced relationships with bodies such as food banks, health centers, schools, and other SA, uh, ISAs, among others. And the prioritization on collaboration uh, during COVID stood in contrast to funder practices during normal times centered on competition between agencies. Now, there's a strong link between collaboration and advocacy, both which are about uh, voice and about listening. Uh, and the lesson that we should take from this is that collaboration works and should be the uh, driving ethic in the sector over hyper competitiveness. And of course, during the pandemic, we saw a real strong spirit of sharing uh, take, uh, take place. So what is advocacy? Uh, broadly, advocacy is the act of uh, voicing the concerns and needs of the constituency, uh, conveying their opinion and representing their interest to the state and to others, including the public at large. Uh, nonprofit organizations like ISA have two key roles to play, that is service and advocacy. Uh, they are, of course, mission-based organizations and they're focused on working collaboratively for mutual benefit. You know, that's part of their, uh, their, their essence. Uh, but there's been an attempt by government funders in the past to separate the service and the advocacy role, and even perhaps to delegitimate the advocacy role. Now, advocacy, of course, is good service. To provide for the needs of clients and communities, we need to hear the voices of those that are served. And we can understand that those uh, uh, that way, their, their needs, and, the, and we also will need to um, uh, make sure that communities can articulate their own interests in this process. Uh, now, part of the problem in the past has been that uh, neoliberalism, which is the driving uh, paradigm uh, that we've experienced uh, for the last number of decades, and austerity and new public management that uh, goes along with this, has worked to marketize uh, nonprofit work. It's attempted to make agencies purely service providers under contract, and also, as I said before, to even delegitimate the advocacy role of nonprofits. Of course, this whole process has been an uneven one. Uh, it's taken. It's been stronger in some places than others. Perhaps uh, not as strong in Quebec. Maybe Stefan uh, can make some comments with respect to that. Now, that doesn't mean that advocacy has disappeared, but it has been turned to turn to borrow a concept from Bauman into what we might refer to as liquid advocacy. That is the advocacy that uh, loses its solid form and becomes more precarious in its character, where nonprofits must be flexible in how they engage in advocacy uh, so that it becomes more intermittent, more hybrid, and more massed in its forms so that they can uh, escape uh, some of the displeasure of government funders. Now, in this process, contradictory tendencies are set in motion. And there's been, of course, the long uh, uh, problem uh, of advocacy chill. Uh, so on the one hand, uh, organizations are incentivized to refrain or downplay advocacy. On the other hand, because of the further marginalization of migrant populations, uh, that has resulted in some organizations becoming and uh, having to become more active in terms of engaging in advocacy. But this tension results in a fragmented response among nonprofits, so that coordinating, uh, planning, strategizing becomes more difficult. So this is a very difficult environment in which to engage in advocacy for the sector. Uh, given its history, it's not surprising that advocacy remains an issue of some sensitivity within the sector and there's different approaches. Some prefer the language of community engagement, 
Others speak about cooperation and collaboration. Others, of course, embrace the idea of advocacy fully. Uh, but I think all organizations within the sector are concerned with the voice role. And of course, uh, voice is linked both to the idea of collaboration and to advocacy. Now, there's different types of advocacy I should point out here. Uh, and the first thing to point out maybe is also that there's different players with respect to this. There's the ISAs, which are on the front line, and they have capacity challenges. And as I'll say shortly, I think they're engaged more in softer forms of advocacy. There's the uh, LIPS, uh, which have much more of a coordination and in, inform, uh, information uh, type of role. And then umbrella organizations like Okazi and, and TCRA, uh, who uh, take on, I think, more um, uh, direct uh, forms of advocacy. Uh, so uh, the hard advocacy involves direct lobbying of government. Uh, and engaging in uh, some public criticism and some in uh, some challenging of government uh, policy, maybe even uh, protest uh, movements. Soft advocacy, by contrast, is about engaging with funders and policymakers, but often behind the scenes with regular communication, consultation, informing and educating officials around current issues and concerns. Um, and uh, in here, there's you know perhaps more emphasis on consensus building. Uh, it also involves building alliances and understandings uh, within and outside the sector through discussions and education and finding common foundations for solidarity. Uh, advocacy in the nonprofit sector is about relationships and engagement between the state and nonprofits. And inevitably, this involves both collaboration and conflict. And the effect of the softer forms of advocacy, of course, rests on a willingness of government officials and funders to listen, to engage as co-producers and services, and respect the voices and perspectives of the agencies, and often act upon them. Uh, of course, neoliberalism engaged nonprofits, but not, uh, but only as contracted alternative service delivery agencies, not as true partners with voice. And this has often been referred to as antagonistic uh, collaboration because it's not really based upon true partnership. Now, the key uh, development during the COVID pandemic in Canada is that the IRC relationship with ISAs and the broader settlement sector shifted with the move away from new public management approaches, you know, neoliberal approaches to one of truer partnerships based on listening, regular communication, respectful relationships, rule relaxation, and uh, to enhance flexibility, collaboration, and strong government support for the sector. Now, there, there is some, I think, contrast with Quebec here, because uh, in Quebec, there seemed to be uh, more of an approach by the provincial government to leave the sector uh, kind of on its own, if you will, and uh, to manage through the pandemic, uh, but uh, with a sector that had greater resources, I would say, than uh, the sector outside of Quebec in terms of its funding and in, in even in terms of having some core based funding. And again, maybe uh, Stefan has some uh, comments with respect to this. Uh, so uh, this is a context in which soft advocacy uh, is, I think, effective at building collaboration and cooperation uh, between partners where voice is heard and acted upon, at least, uh, again, outside of the outside of Quebec, uh, where there was that engagement with IRCC. And I think that's a, a very significant development. Now, the pandemic uh, opened up a policy window, I would argue, creating space for alternative visions of policy, including for immigrant settlement. Uh, the hegemony of uh, neoliberal approaches was challenged and the prospect of building back better along more inclusive lines became a possibility. The pandemic is a, a great revealer and a reshaper, reshaper of relationships. And it was a time of building connections and alliances for common purposes. Uh, the concern, of course, is that these lessons of the pandemic may not survive the recovery. And there will be a return to past practice and a more one-sided competitive funding relationship where voice is muted and the policy window it becomes comes to be shut. In fact, I think it may already be closing. 
and uh, uh, with a return uh, to the, uh, uh, an emphasis upon uh, deficits. And perhaps a change of government as well at the federal level may uh, make for a full sort of closing of, of that window. Now, resiliency and advocacy. It is the social justice mission, I think, including the voice-oriented components of that mission that drive nonprofit organizations to be innovative and resilient. This is primarily not the neoliberal idea of resilience that rests in individualized notions of the ability to resiliently endure and for ISAs to do more with less. The everyday resilience, if you will, of nonprofits that prevent them from building capacity, real capacity to, to manage crises. Uh, now, of course, ISAs have proven to be remarkable at their ability to engage in this everyday resilience, but this is not really uh, a true sustainable uh, capacity building uh, exercise over the longer term. Uh, resilience is not just a reactive capacity, but it can also be proactive with the possibility of collective transformation. Hence, resilience is not just about bouncing back, but it's about the possibilities of bounding forward. And this speaks to progressive forms of resilience rooted in social resilience and transformative uh, resilience. Social resilience, in other words, has significant transformative power. And I think we need to pay attention to this. As part of the uh, settlement sector, advocacy uh, is the need to not just advocate for immigrant, for immigrant communities, but promote self-advocacy by clients and cause advocacy directed at policy transformation. Um, so these are transformative uh, approaches uh, that we need uh, to uh, embrace or the sector needs to embrace. Uh, in this process, immigrants and their communities are empowered. They're enabled uh, with the capacity to amplify their voices and exercise influence over their own destinies. For nonprofit organizations, consequently, their advocacy role is not only to speak on behalf of their clients, but to aid in the empowerment of immigrants as citizens uh, with collective voice. This is key to achieving social justice and to building back better. Now, going forward, I think uh, there is a great danger that uh, new public management's hyper-competitive funding model uh, with the settlement sector will once again dominate with a closing down of uh, advocacy voice and the collaborative spirit. Under uh, conditions of hybrid service delivery, uh, this, will be, this could be greatly intensified because of the competition that that opens up uh, for agencies to compete with each other. Uh, now that they, with uh, hybrid types of services, they can actually provide their services at a distance uh, in catchment areas that weren't traditionally their own. And that would of course be uh, quite difficult, especially for smaller and mid-sized uh, organizations and for governments that are uh, oriented towards uh, enhancing this uh, idea of competition again and probably put, put, put placing stress on reducing costs. I think that poses a real danger. That's, you know, uh, in terms of the, the new technologies, which provide a lot of advantages uh, to newcomers and to the, the, the sector. Uh, there's also this, this potential uh, danger, which I think could be uh, quite significant. And if this occur occurs, of course, the lessons of the pandemic will not have been have been learned. And on that, I'm going to uh, close out. Thank you. Thank you, John. I just want to remind the participants to put your uh, type your questions into the questions and answer section. Our next presenter is Jill Hanley. Hello, everybody. I am going to do our next presentation here and we're going to move into a more direct comparison of the experience during COVID of the Ontario and Quebec immigrant serving agencies during COVID and um, recognize my colleague Musa Sek that uh, we worked on doing the Quebec data collection together. So um, 
And uh, again, we, we were a whole team that worked on this. So you, you've heard a bit already about how we did this study from Valerie, so I won't repeat. But uh, just to mention, I don't think we mentioned the Quebec numbers before that there were 27 agencies that responded to our um, uh, survey and 89 uh, frontline workers. So we're drawing on the data from both Ontario and Quebec in here. So again, I guess we're kind of like in, in this from the first two presentations, but a reminder that like when, when the pandemic first broke in the early days, there was a lot of fear and uncertainty about how things are going to play out. We really didn't understand for a while um, what form the uh, of restrictions might affect us, how people might be uh, influenced in their lives, but it was very clear early on that newcomers were among the most vulnerable. So um, you know, they may not have been in a situation where they have social supports in terms of extended family, friend networks, that type of thing. Uh, they didn't necessarily know about what public support services were available. And we put a lot of work during the, the pandemic trying to like get the information to newcomers. Language barriers to understand the public information that was being put out or to access what services were available increasingly remotely, which we know when you have a language barrier, remote is even more difficult. And their living and working conditions uh, put them at higher risk of COVID exposure and um, <clears throat> more serious consequences if they did get ill. So all of these things meant that the immigrant serving agencies in both Ontario and Quebec had a big role to play in terms of increasing access for this population. And we can see clearly, uh, you know, I think many of you are probably working in in these agencies directly, you know that people were very committed to serve this community during COVID and our survey plays that out also. So um, just to think about what context were these agencies working in uh, during the pandemic? So there were there's some conditions that were different prior to COVID existing. And John uh, mentioned this already that um, Quebec agencies uh, with funds being transferred through the Quebec Immigration Ministry, they already had a more flexible funding model and it had been granted before COVID that Quebec settlement agencies could serve, provide settlement services to temporary foreign workers, migrant workers and international students. Um, ISAs in the rest of Canada still don't have that possibility. And I've heard it over and over at, at the P2P conference this week, how much agencies in Ontario and elsewhere are wishing that they could get funding to serve these populations, but Quebec had it before the pa uh, pandemic hit. Uh, we know that in the early months, Quebec was harder hit by, by COVID, the uh, lockdowns were more severe, but over time, uh, schools opened earlier in Quebec, businesses opened earlier in Quebec, and there was um, uh, different uh, implementation in different ways. Um, one thing uh, John mentioned, but this is something I always find very impressive, was that the uh, Quebec Umbrella Organization, uh, in the absence of sort of government guidance on what role um, immigrant serving agencies should play, it took it upon themselves to, through a press conference, announcing themselves as essential service. And this is a big deal because we know that um, uh, organizations or companies that were operating outside the rules for the lockdown. So if you were open when you weren't supposed to be, there were legal um, implications for this. And uh, the TCRI made the decision to just sort of take it upon themselves to say, like, we are essential. And so we are going to continue to provide at least some services in person. And if this was accepted and not uh, countered by the government during this time. Um, another thing that was very helpful in Quebec is that the, the provincial government was making announcements promising that they were not going to cut funding during the crisis. So they were telling organizations, continue what you're doing for now, you don't have to worry about money for now. So this had a big impact on like how managers could respond during COVID. So first of all, we see that all of the agencies that responded from Ontario, they all had to lay off employees. Whereas in Quebec, only one third of them did. So already this is a starting point of like, is the organization stable or not? Do people working there feel secure in their jobs or not? And we see that there was more insecurity for Ontario staff. Um, and we, we see that 87% of the Ontario agencies shifted to work online uh, entirely only 37% of Quebec agencies did. So they were continuing to receive people in person. 
in Quebec. So that again, changes the work conditions a lot. Uh, almost all the Quebec agencies were able to access additional funding during COVID that were specifically available to help them respond to COVID related challenges. Um, whereas the Ontario agencies turned more to fundraising, you see that 43% there, or the um, uh, uh, social enterprise, like uh, raising funds through service, that type of thing. Um, so in both provinces, uh, the agencies, despite this kind of difficult uh, context, 59% were actually increasing their services dur during COVID. So despite how hard it was, they were doing more. And only 2% in Ontario and 14% um, in, in, uh, in Quebec decreased their services. Um, finally, we see a difference in their reporting of increasing collaborations. We see that in Ontario, uh, uh, three quarters were saying that they increased their collaborations. Number in Quebec was lower. And we think this may be because the Quebec agencies are already part of um, neighborhood councils, um, uh, collaborative tables at the city level, that type of thing. Uh, the Quebec community movement is already structured around those types of collaborations, so they might not have been increasing their collaborations, but they were still using them. Um, the other thing is that when we asked the managers uh, what they were thinking, looking forward, and this I think would be interesting the discussion to hear from some of you how this has panned out, but um, they were expecting in Quebec, 63% were expecting to have major changes to the way that they were offering services and the types of services they were offering. We, a lot of Quebec agencies, I think, were experiencing a, an explosion in access to their services by migrant workers and, and international students and were adapting to this um, increased demand uh, versus 38% in Ontario thought that there would be big changes to their service provision. That's partly, I think, because the, the funding framework hadn't changed in this time. Um, and interestingly, and to me, this really says a lot about the strength of the sector is that staff relations were stable or improved in both provinces. So in a context where everything was difficult, people were stressed out, they had family re uh, responsibilities, still they felt um, connected to their organizations and that, that their relationships among themselves uh, stable or improved. We see 26% of Quebec agencies are expecting their funding to go up, whereas only 10% do in Ontario. 41% of Ontario agencies expect a drop in funding versus only 7% in Quebec. So you can see that the feeling in the two places is a bit different looking forward. So what about the workers, the frontline uh, uh, settlement workers? So in both places, um, they, they had preoccupations about their own health and the health of, of their families and also economic difficulties. Were they going to run into financial problems because of the, the uh, pandemic? So you could see that it's high in both places, slightly lower in Quebec. Um, and they were concerned about whether uh, the in-person work was going to have a negative effect on their family. Were they going to bring infection home to their family? Were they going to have to, uh, you know, would they find themselves not able to provide the care that they would want for young children or elders in their household? So you can see um, uh, both places they worried about that. Slightly higher in Quebec, but surprising it's not even higher given that many more of those workers were actually working in person. Um, and they also kind of like working from home, at least some of the time. So um, th there were a few people that felt less productive working uh, when they were working at home. But generally, people felt like they could get some good stuff done from, the, uh, from their homes. Um, but they also felt that there were some risks related to working from home. So that there was some mental health, stress-related issues, you know, trying to manage family, maybe not having supportive colleagues the same way, being out of the loop with colleagues, hard to have that work-life balance uh, when you're, your whole household's around you when you're trying to do work. Um, and then also this uh, issue of social isolation and whether as uh, working from home, you were maybe going to have some economic um, uh, precarity there, you're not maybe felt as, as central to the organization. So people were worried. And finally, um, uh, 
Big difference, 77% of Ontario people said that they would like to work from home a majority of the time, but only 54% in Quebec. And I make the joke, maybe they have good snacks in the Quebec agencies and that's why people like to go in. <laughs> okay, and finally, um, uh, some more highlights from workers. The, uh, uh, they, they really were reporting that they were able to increase the services that they were able to, to provide to the, to, to the community to either increase or maintain them. So you can see it's up over 80, like it's right around 80% for both of them. So again, uh, uh, kudos to the settlement sector to be able to do this in such tough um, circumstances, but there were challenges. So outreach was difficult. So when everyone's at home, there aren't the events, there's, there's uh, uh, you know, you can't do outreach in public anymore, really. That was difficult. And the digital access for clients was a big deal of, you know, around 80% for both places. Valerie talked about that, that challenge already. So um, despite that, the workers themselves who are do, doing a frontline connection with the the, the migrants, really felt that people were satisfied. You can see the rate of dissatisfaction perceived extremely low. We know that people don't always say when they're dissatisfied, but still very low perceived uh, dissatisfaction. And, and look at this uh, confidence in their agency's response to COVID. I mean, this is very high. And I think not all, all uh, employers could enjoy that level of confidence from their workers. So finally, uh, getting to the overarching portrait of settlement agencies during COVID. So again, there's no question, we really see evidence here of committed and resilient management and frontline front workers in this context. And um, you, you know, um, evidence also of their ability to rapidly adjust to a shifting context, to be able to maintain or even expand their services when it was just so hard to do so. I think it's impressive. I, I'm saying this today when Quebec is in the middle of a massive public sector strike, they were not satisfied with the conditions and relationship with management during COVID that's led to huge labor relations issues right now. Uh, settlement workers in general, their beef was not with their management. So that, that says a lot. Um, but we do see that the Quebec agencies were served well by the flexibility in the funding system and also the mandate to serve a broader clientele. When there was such a crisis and people were so vulnerable, I think it it would feel terrible to, uh, you know, feel you have to turn people away. And what we know happens in most settlement agencies is they don't turn them away; they just don't get funded to serve uh, migrant workers and international students or undocumented. So the fact that Quebec had already recognized the need to fund those types of services is important, and that's something I think in the rest of Canada that would be nice to have IRCC recognize that type of uh, clientele as legitimate, uh, you know, recipients of settlement services. And it does seem that the Ontario agencies are facing more uncertainty looking forward. So thanks, and I look forward to the conversation with everybody. Thank, Thank you very you. much, uh, Jill. I just wanted to let you know that we have an amazing 76 participants online and don't all ask questions, but I hope that some of you will put questions in the Q&A. But before we go to the questions, I'd like to turn it over to uh, Stefan Reichold. Well, uh, uh, do I have to do something? I just open my mic. You see me, you hear me. So hello, I'm uh, Stéphane Reichold. I'm the director of uh, la TCRI, la table de concertation des organismes au service des, <coughs> des personnes réfugiées et migrantes, which is the umbrella organization in Quebec of uh, organizations serving newcomers uh, of status. Uh, I think everything has been said <laughs> uh, among, uh, especially what what came up in, in 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 Quebec. Especially, I think the 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 important thing to to remember, and that's by chance. I mean, we've been in 2019, and <laughs> we didn't expect the COVID coming, but the government opened, as uh, Jill said. Uh, settlement services to all newcomers, even temporary workers, uh, international students, and without uh, time limits, and also uh, French classes and language uh, training. So, uh, which was, uh, of course, very helpful for the agency. So, the agency were already, uh, they started to be used 
but uh, also what came out in the survey is the there were when COVID arrived in March 2020, the uh, the organization were already in transition with this new clientele they were not familiar with, especially all the status uh, and the, the bridges to permanent status and all that. So we already started a lot of training with, with our members around this. And, uh, and uh, also, the, um, but basically, I mean, the, the, the uh, Challenges were quite similar in Ontario and in Quebec. The difference was that the condition in the, where the settlement sector was, in terms of resources, in terms of uh, uh, access to to uh, to all new clientele and uh, users, and um, also uh, um, the funding situation was was very uh, say. Uh, comfortable because uh, the new government came in place, La CAC, uh, Le Gaulle came in place in 2019, no, 2018, I think, uh, yeah, uh, decided to invest really new money in settlement services, uh, which didn't have been the case for years in Quebec. So just in the year 1920, most of the settlement agencies doubled or tripled their budgets. Uh, which was, of course, very helpful <laughs> to cover the situation, to invest. And as, as Jill said, also, uh, the, the funding rules and, and, and also reporting is much more flexible in Quebec than it is done by RCC and the rest of Canada. So, and also a point that I think with John was very uh, uh, important, is the the uh, relation to advocacy, which in Quebec historically traditionally advocacy is uh, supported by the government, and there's a, a, a policy. Uh, we have a policy since two thousand one that uh, uh, how do you say uh, policy uh, for for the rules the relation between. Uh, the government, the state, and community organization, which is called the uh, Politique Gouvernementale de l'Action Communautaire, which, uh, which uh, says that uh, community organizations are important for the debate, debate for the democracy. And should it's okay if you criticize the government, and it's, it's good for the democracy. That's what's written in the policy. And we gonna, as, as government, gonna support that. So there are special funds to do advocacy and uh, in all the different uh, uh, community sectors, also in our in the immigration settlement sector. So we benefit from this fund, especially uh, not all the agencies, but uh, it's uh, culturally accepted, I mean, to be contrary in the other parts of the country. So, uh, so of course, when when there were the first in the first wave, uh, COVID wave, we made a lot of big scandal on how the government <laughs> reacted towards you know uh, immigrant and ethno cultural ethno specific uh, population because all the policy were were thought and decided centralized in Quebec City. And they didn't realize that there were immigrants in Montreal. I mean, when they put the, the, the measure in place, a good example was, for example, the, the test centers where you had to go to test COVID uh, if you're positive or negative. Uh, you need a, a, a card, or you need a coverage, uh, insurance coverage from the government to, the, uh, to, to get in the center, you know, which Many new companies don't have are not coverage, and the temporary worker, not, most of them are not covered by the public system. So we had to to do a big campaign. I mean, to to stop this incredible nonsense. And the same thing arrived again when when there was time to 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 get a vaccine. 
uh, also they, they asked to get into the vaccine centers, they asked uh, the cards, you know, and uh, which also again we had to do a big scandal because they stopped to, to act that. So this was the type of the agencies had to do, I mean, beside, of course, all the other work. Uh, but uh, what, uh, of course, the question is, uh, we, we learned a lot, of course, all the part of, of technology tools and so on, which is still useful uh, these days. But as I don't remember who said it, Jill or, or, or John, uh, I mean, we, we're going back to the pre-COVID uh, way to, to, to work. This only difference that we, we have, uh, there's more money, more resources, and, uh, and uh, there are lots of, it's very, as umbrella organization also, it was very useful. I think Ocasi has the same experience in Ontario that uh, because every agency had to be equipped for 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 uh, 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 teleconferences and so on zero conferences and so for especially for for, for our member agencies who are more in the region uh, far away we can't attend to meetings and all that so it's much more easier now. I mean, to get the communication, to support, to do training, which we didn't do before COVID. And with COVID, we learned really to to do to intervene much more effectively with our agencies. So I don't know. I would love to to answer questions. I'm not very good at telling. Sorry. Thank you very much, Stefan. I think you'll get your wish to answer questions because uh, we have three uh, questions and comments that are up uh, that are up now, and um, uh, two of the comments touch on uh, touch on seniors, and this is really interesting. I, I'm going to try to turn them into questions because they're, they're presented as comments. Is that did um, did the settlement organizations find that seniors? turned increasingly to them during the pandemic because two people here are saying that nobody could really nobody from nobody could could really help the seniors during the pandemic at the level of uh, family members because the family members were too busy working in essential services and that seniors may have reached out more to uh, the settlement organizations to get help and uh, one person from Alberta suggests that that that's become now uh, something that they, they do more. They rely on outreach workers more than their family members. So I'd like to hear comments from whoever wants to feel that. I'll reply. Um, that's a really interesting observation. I actually haven't heard that from any of the agencies. And I'll look at the data we've got because we do identify seniors as a group. Um, I don't remember it changing in either Ontario or Quebec uh, in terms of their client numbers. Um, but what I do know is in Ontario, some immigrant serving agencies, particularly the ones that are more ethno-specific, develop very innovative ways of serving seniors. So we have a, a, a agency that mainly serves the South Asian community from Pakistan initially. And um, they have had a long history of trying to set up social enterprises that train youth in um, coding and social media technology. And they were able to get some funding, and they actually developed programs, installed them, and trained seniors on how to be digitally connected, uh, seniors who had previously not been. And it was very effective. Um, so 
I don't remember, Jill, you've seen the Quebec data too. I don't remember any evidence of an increase in use that leads up to September 2021 by seniors. So um, I can share some results from another study that I was part of during COVID that in the, in the early days, we, um, we were documenting the response in Montreal to the early lockdowns. And we definitely had um, lots of interviews with exactly what you're saying, Valerie, the ethno-specific organizations that are, they don't receive settlement funding. They were, maybe even did more like cultural activities and stuff like that before very mobilized for things like Meals on Wheels and um, check-ins with seniors. And we heard a lot of stories of um, even like meal deliveries to children that were left at home because their parents were working in essential services. So I don't mean like baby children by themselves, but you know, a household where there's a 14 year old with younger siblings and the, both parents are working in hospitals or something. And these ethno-specific organizations were doing meal deliveries also as a service like to check in on kids and seniors. So there was definitely a big mobilization, but not, um, it wasn't the settlement organizations per se, although they continue to serve seniors in, in on the settlement issues that they did. There were referrals between them also. So th that was also something I think pretty amazing that was happening during COVID. And just the final thing, I think that the realization that so many kids were home alone, that there were seniors left without support in their homes was one of the things that led to Quebec, I think, opening schools earlier than other provinces did and um, having more open services a bit earlier because we were documenting a lot of uh, people left home alone. Yeah, I think one of the challenges in Ontario was that the agencies largely closed for large uh, periods of time, and for, at least for a lot of seniors. Um, you know, getting the uh, access, uh, physical access to the agencies uh, was uh, was important. Um, so that definitely would have created uh, uh, obstacles. Also, uh, and I think it was a point that Valerie uh, made, is that there was a real decline in the number of volunteers. Um, and so people going uh, available uh, to go uh, to homes um, uh, to assist uh, was uh, definitely negatively uh, impact. Also, a lot of the volunteers, of course, um, tend to be older people. <laughs> and this has continued to be a problem for the nonprofit sector in the post, uh, well, the so-called post-pandemic uh, period, uh, because the numbers of volunteers has not returned uh, to previous levels. And that's been particularly uh, negative uh, in terms of uh, uh, older uh, older volunteers. Um, uh, but again, I think uh, um, I think we need a lot more information on this because I think it's a really uh, interesting and important uh, important question. And uh, I'm not sure much our our survey data uh, give us a few hints, but I'm not sure it's going to provide us with a lot of information on this particular aspect. Stefan, do you have anything to add concerning seniors? Yeah, I, 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 I confirm what, what Jill said, uh, the dynamic uh, with older. It's general speaking, it's it's an important issue for the settlement sector. Uh, older people, but they're starting now offering some because the because of the as I said the the, the open they open the settlement services also to elderly people who are here since 50 years who are not born in in, uh, in, in Canada are now admissible I mean the, the, the agency get money and to, to help them and uh, even when they don't speak French or English or to do their they also access to French courses with uh, allocation now every person who goes to now, uh, uh, since last year, uh, uh, the government of Quebec is uh, uh, to have access to uh, language training is a right now by law. So if you want to learn French, the government is obliged to offer you <laughs> a French class and also to give you allocation if it's full time. It's not 
thousand two hundred dollars a month. So so you can go. So the condition and this also for elder elder people, which is very helpful. We have a question that was directed to John, but I think that Stefan may have uh, something to say about it. So um, the participant says, John, interested in your thoughts on how government delegitimizes advocacy in practice. Also, do you find that it depends on the issue advocacy is focused on? Well, um, it's a very good question. Uh, I would just say that the uh, approach of neoliberal governance is one that you know treats uh, agencies as alternative service deliverers. Uh, and so as a consequence, the focus is on the service delivery and uh, not as kind of voice uh, organizations. Also, uh, if you remember during the Harper period of government, um, that's probably the most stark uh, examples. Uh, the uh, Canada Revenue Agency was often used um, as a way to challenge uh, some of the, especially uh, in this case, it was especially around uh, organizations that were dealing with um, environmental uh, types of issues, uh, challenge their legitimacy and their, their tax uh, 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 status, uh, charitable status. Uh, but also, uh, you know, looking at the kinds of language that was used on the websites of uh, many, uh, in fact, uh, immigrant uh, agencies. So, so there was definitely this sort of sense that, well, agencies shouldn't bite the hand that feeds them. <laughs> uh, and uh, therefore, you know, it was, it was viewed as, I think, by agencies as somewhat problematic, to say the least, uh, to raise their voices too loud. Now, they still engaged, I would say, in the softer forms of advocacy because, you know, the the agencies were the ones that were dealing with all of the, the clients. So the government did need to know what was happening in the field. And the way you find out about that is you interact with the, with the agency. So there was communication and consultation of some sort that was, that was going on there. Uh, but in more vocal forms of advocacy were, were definitely uh, often viewed uh, hostily by, uh, by, by government funders. Again, I think the situation in Quebec, and Stefan can certainly speak to this, is a, is a different one, because I think there's more of a history, uh, at least since the Quiet Revolution, uh, in terms of the importance of social movements and uh, uh, the, the role of uh, uh, community-based uh, agencies in, in terms of the, the history of the politics of Quebec? Uh, yes, I know. I mean, uh, uh, theoretically, yes. I mean, uh, it's something which is written and uh, the, the role of community organization, not all over, all the sectors of the women, youth, uh, uh, housing, or we have 20 organized sectors were recognized and, 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 and funded by the government as, as umbrellas. Uh, they fund the umbrellas uh, like TCRE to do advocacy and social transformation. But uh, when, when uh, agencies, I mean, make a public statement against the policy, it happens. Uh, Sometimes they get a phone call from the minister office and <laughs> we will tell them, please, uh, we are funding you and we don't hear or want to hear this type of thing. So our role is then to take out the policy and see like, it's written in your governmental policy that we it's our role, our mission to do that. So it's a give, take and give uh, always, but Globally, I mean, the, this public policy we have in recognition of uh, community organization is a kind of, uh, in assurance, uh, insurance guarantee for us. I mean, that's because we hold on it. And uh, so, but, but it's, as I say, I mean, depends, you know. It's, 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 yeah. It's, yeah, and the funding model, certainly outside of Quebec, uh, is one that doesn't uh, really have uh, money that's allocated for advocacy. 
uh, in the seventies, there was some money for this kind of uh, uh, kind of work, but it was really very much stripped out of those budgets as new public management uh, came to take hold and uh, sort of redefine uh, how those funding uh, relationships uh, were go were going to work. We don't actually have any more questions in the Q&A, even though we still have 71 participants online. Uh, you still have a chance for a few more minutes, participants, to ask more questions. If you think of your questions later, I'm sure that you can, uh, that any of the panelists will be very happy to exchange with you by email. Um, and of course, this session is being recorded. It'll be up there sooner or later, probably sooner, because the P2P is very uh, efficient. Uh, so unless any more questions come up, I just want to ask the three presenters if, and Stefan for your final thoughts. I'd just like to say that I, I am so happy to see the number of people who tuned in for this presentation, that people are obviously still really wanting to like learn from, from the experience during COVID and people are looking to like, John, you were talking about how that we were talking about building back better. Well, if this many people are still thinking about it, then I, I we see that there's still a lot of effort being put into, you know, strengthening the sector. Yeah. And I guess I would just say, I think it's really important to look at the Quebec, Ontario, uh, comparison, because I think there's obviously a lot of commonalities, but there's also some uh, some very important differences. And I think, you know, the advocacy is one of those uh, uh, areas. Uh, and I think there's a lot that can be learned uh, from that. And too often, I don't think we really do that kind of close uh, analysis. And the, the surveys, I think, are very uh, helpful in this regard. And uh, also just, I think, uh, you know, turning our attention more and, and trying to uh, discern these uh, differences uh, are important. And uh, especially with respect to serving um, uh, a broader base of, of, of immigrants, uh, the uh, foreign temporary workers, uh, as well as the uh, international students. And I would also add here, asylum seekers, which is, you know, not part of the... <laughs> Uh, the, uh, the supports, uh, although agencies are actively engaged in, in doing this kind of work. So I think uh, it's this kind of comparison, I think, can be really beneficial in that regard to moving us in a more positive uh, space. John, you're not off the hook yet. We have a new question. Could you please elaborate about the new public management hyper-competitive funding model and its effect? Yeah, okay. Uh, well, obviously, there's a lot to, to the model. Uh, but the model, uh, new public management, is, you know, really comes out of this idea about uh, moving uh, government from uh, the so called idea of rowing, uh, actually doing the services as you know, would have, to some degree, uh, have taken place uh in the 1970s and before to the idea that they're simply steers and that we should get um uh, other uh, agents uh, especially nonprofit agents where services can be delivered much more cheaply by underpaying workers <laughs> and putting them on one year uh one year uh, contracts and then also sort of being able to control those agencies through the through the contract itself so um, it's decentralized in terms of the delivery agent, but actually because there's accountability uh, to the funder in quite minute ways in terms of what they can spend money on, what they can deliver and so forth, the, the funder, the, cent, the, the government actually uh, uh, is able to sort of control a lot of what the agency does. So it reduces the agency's uh, autonomy. Uh, so it, new public management, at least historically, has been associated with uh, short-term contracts, uh, underfunding the operations of organizations. So you're just funding programs, you're not funding the organizations themselves. And of course, programs are run by organizations, so organizations need capacity to be able to do this, but that is underfunded significantly in the model. And the idea is that the agencies will have to um, 
or the agencies because they're nonprofits through their use of volunteers, through their uh, other kinds of fundraising initiatives and so forth, will be able to uh, make up that difference and therefore save government, uh, save government money. It's also one that's based upon the idea of competition, that agencies should be in competition with one another uh, in order to um, uh, meet those contracts. In fact, what you've got is a lot of uh, agencies that are spending a lot of their time and their effort writing funding proposals for short-term short contracts and uh, um, not actually allocating a lot of those resources to frontline uh, types of services. So there's a lot of you know, dysfunctions uh, with this uh, model, I would argue. And But it's one upon, that's based upon the idea that, uh, well, if we turn uh services uh in more on a market like basis that that'll great create greater efficiencies and the question is well what kind of efficiency are we talking about here is it the quality of services or is it just cheaper uh cheaper uh, uh, uh services from from uh what government is spending just very quickly i agree very much with John. I mean, it's uh, the, uh, interesting, I mean, to make this comparison between Quebec on mm -hmm. services on, on survey. I, in my memory, I think it's the first time there's been a serious study <laughs> comparison between uh, in the separate issues and integration. And, uh, and uh, I hope it's just the beginning. Because, as you said, John, it's uh, very interesting for us also on the Quebec side. I mean, there's also positive things in, in Ontario, not only in Quebec, uh, so where we can learn. So, because it's uh, terrible. I mean, when I talk with colleagues in Ontario, I mean, they have no clue what's going on in Quebec. And in Quebec, there's no clue what's going on in the sector in Ontario. So, uh, I think it's a, it was a very good initiative. Yeah, Chris, let me make two comments. Um, I agree the provincial comparison is really important and revealing for all the reasons that everyone has said. Um, but I also think it's important. I think we have these two surveys in Ontario and it's very unusual to be able to sort of monitor what is happening during a period of great change. And I think that's very valuable as well uh, because it's only through that comparison that you begin to see questions such as, how are we gonna maintain this hybrid model if we go back to the old funding regime come up? And how are we in Quebec? They can maintain a hybrid model because they have a more money, and b they have more control over how they use it. So you need the combination of both. Um, and I, and the reason I think it's important is that the Ontario settlement agencies, given their sort of precarity because of new public management did an extraordinary job restoring services and then coming up with a hybrid model that allowed them to serve such vulnerable clients as seniors. And we need to really listen to them and examine why they were able to do that so that we can make an argument for long-term change um, and it is, so it's the combination we need. We need regular information about what's happening in the sector in both places and the opportunities to compare it between both provinces and jurisdictions so they can learn from each other. Um, so that would be my comment. Any other closing thoughts? In that case, I'm going to... Uh... Thank everybody for participating. And uh, those of us, you uh, who are at the conference, um, have a good afternoon. And everybody else, uh, thank you so much.